Welcome home, co-journers. I'm so glad you're here, and I am excited about today's episode. We're going to talk about holistic healing from sexual trauma. Holistic healing from sexual trauma. And we have a very special guest with us on today, Dr. Sheena Young, who is a licensed body-centered psychologist, healer, artist. She owns a private practice, embodied truth healing, and psychological services rooted in Los Angeles, California, where she offers mind, body, heart, spirit care in healing from sexual, racial, intergenerational, and ancestral trauma. Dr. Sheena's work has been featured in Bustle, Huffington Post, The Lily by The Washington Post, and Therapy for Black Girls. She has consulted for The Body, A Home for Love, Body Girl in Own, Loveland Foundation, and Me Too Movement Communities. I am delighted to say, along with being a colleague, she is a dear sister friend, and I am grateful for her presence and want to celebrate her new book, Body Rights, a holistic healing and embodiment workbook for Black survivors of sexual trauma. Welcome, Dr. Sheena. Thank you so much, Dr. Sheena. It feels so special to hear you introducing me, given our long journey together. Yes. Well, Mm -hmm. this time is so special for me. And I will start with your voice. And many times when we have presented together, you have talked about both the softness and the strength Mm -hmm. that you carry. And when I read the opening prayer of your book, it talks about us being soft and fierce. May your collective body be soft and fierce. And I wanted to start with that question of why is it important for us to embrace both our softness and our fierceness? Mm, I love this so much, Dr. Tima. And before we respond, I just want to offer a content and care warning, a take care warning for anyone that may be listening, given that we will Mm -hmm. be talking about trauma and sexual trauma specifically. And In that opening prayer, also acknowledging um, guides and ancestor survivors specifically that want to show up to this conversation. (laughs) And so um, just grounding in in their energy and the desire to continue to venerate and make them proud. Mm, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this soft power or soft fierceness for me, is about two aspects of our being. Living in Black bodies specifically can be really disembodying. Living in bodies with targets on them can make being at home in the body really difficult and maybe even seem impossible. And so many of us harden, live beside ourselves or outside of our bodies and softness can feel like a privilege. Mm. And at the same time, we are fierce and powerful given our collective stories as BIPOC beings in general. But I think that survivors of sexual trauma have a unique, complex prism and power. And so the prayer, the opening prayer is an invitation to discover softness in the body and to remember power in all the ways, power and spirit, mind, body, heart, and spirit. Mm, Beautiful. Thank you so much for us to be mindful and have the permission for the full range of our human experience instead of feeling like we have to remain stuck or clinging, clutching in the either softness or in the power, right? Mm -hmm. But to have all of that. One of the powerful things that you say in the welcome is healing is a process. It is something to own. And so Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can share what does it mean to own our healing? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. You know, being victimized and violated, particularly in interpersonal traumas and sexual trauma, robs us of our power, choice, and agency in the act of the violation. And also often in the experience of deciding if we want to seek help, who do we tell? And so oftentimes people will keep it a secret. Mm-hmm. They may become suspended in the victimization. And, you know, that that makes sense, right? Sometimes we're also suspended in the fight, flight, freeze, submit, and tend and befriend modes, which can make it challenging to see other possibilities, to tap into other possibilities within our own being, but also in resourcing and, and healing and help seeking. And so... I believe that owning the opportunity, the possibility, the responsibility um, of healing is a beautiful first step and intention and a beginning path to snatching back power, control, and choice so that we can be at home in our bodies. Mm. Yes. And can you clarify for the listeners when you say suspended, what does that mean, being suspended in our victimhood? Right. So ideally, when we experience something difficult or traumatic and our nervous systems get activated to keep us safe, they our um, nervous system helps us to mobilize to fight, flight, freeze, submit, to tend and befriend. I mentioned those a, a couple of seconds ago. Ideally, after the threat has passed, we are able to come back to a healthy baseline and mobilize in ways that, that serve us, mm-hmm. right? That support our healing. But notice I mentioned the word ideally a couple of times. <laughs> we yeah. don't live in an ideal world. And for BIPOC folks, particularly survivors, it's not like we can move away from the crime scene, the body being the crime scene, the body is the place. And so often we get stuck in survival mode instead of being able to move forward in the healing mode. So when I say suspended, it's like you're hanging out in the what happened, the past, the experience, the destruction to mind, body, heart, spirit, the things that were lost and aren't able to move forward and free ourselves just enough to move toward healing possibilities. Mm, Yes. Thank you so much. I know often we put so much pressure on ourselves about Mm -hmm. where, where we're supposed to be and what it's supposed to look like And for us to have compassion for ourselves and patience for ourselves for our unique journey. And speaking of our journey, you talk about both the individual and collective experience, and you give background on colonization. And so many people may have heard uh, language around decolonizing. Can you talk about what it means to decolonize our healing journey? Yes. Um, I love this question because there's a lot of buzzwords <laughs> that are floating <laughs> around in the healing space and decolonizing is is one of them. I feel like it is um, overused <laughs> sometimes. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate the ability, the opportunity to define what it means to me. Yes. And again, I come from the space of working with folks of African ancestry in particular. And so depending on what side of the, you know, the pond (laughs) you live on, right, this may mean something different to you. So generally, you know, westernized approaches to healing tend to lean into systemic infrastructures of power and control. And they are imprints of colonization and white supremacy. They condition all of us to externalize our intuition and choice and often infer that 
the feelings, the feelings of folks of a global majority are inappropriate or too much. And I believe that self-determination is a path to liberation and really roots into some of our ancestral wisdoms. You know, um, the enslavement of African people in particular and colonization forbade our people's use of their indigenous medicines, access to sacred plants and herbs and music, language, movement, foods, spiritual tools. And we were people deeply connected to the elements, earth, water, air, fire. We had, we held our elders clothes and our ancestors in sacred embrace. And we moved and elevated in healing as a collective and community. And so much of that was lost in the colonization, in colonization and enslavement. So when I'm speaking about decolonizing, it is reclaiming all of those layers and beautiful nuances and tools, um, bringing them into the healing experience. So moving away the westernized blueprint, also complementing it in some ways. So for me, leaning into land-based approaches and connection with nature, indigenous wisdoms, African spiritual traditions. And ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about nourishing a world that brings these ancient healing traditions and wisdoms forward into our modern world with integrity, and reverence and respect. And at the core, as you've mentioned a couple of times, that means caring for offering care that is holistic and considers the overlap and the connection between mind, body, heart, and spirit. Mm, yes. So beautiful and important. And when we think about indigenous medicine, indigenous psychology, we often think of community and connection, and you use the phrase the support squad, which I love <laughs> uh, how important it is for us to have people uh, that we are connected with and accepted by. And I wonder if you can highlight how it's both specifically challenging and also necessary for sexual trauma survivors to have that support squad. Right. Right. So when we're talking about mind, body, heart, spirit care, the heart piece is specifically about our relationships, relationship to self and others, community, collective, and beyond. And what can happen as a survivor of sexual trauma is that, that there's a rupture in the heart space. There, that in the heart space is where themes of betrayal, trust, love show up. And so when the heart gets bruised or broken um, or harmed by sexual trauma and interpersonal trauma that happens between humans, it can be really devastating. And so it's natural to be weary, to be cautious and yielded. And some, some of us out of protection may even expect, start to expect harm or expect that hurt will come. There's that mistrust again. And so the heart healing is about rediscovering connection with self and love of self and also community. I talk about how in the book, um, Body Rights, how the, the rupture Every time a survivor, someone is harmed in this way, it is harm to the community. It is a heart wound to community. And we need the support of folks coming close and embracing us and listening to our stories and um, holding us and helping us to believe that another way is possible, reminding us that we are exactly where we need to be and to have self-compassion. But then there's also that that piece about um, the piece about healing and trust with community. Yes, yes, that trust in community and knowing we are worthy of that and deserving of that, 
and you talk also about uh, self-care, different self-care practices, including journaling, and as a number of uh, books, as opposed to the way a number of books that only look at us as identical, you specifically name that our ideas about self-care may have been shaped by our gender, by our culture, or by the modeling of our caretakers. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could speak to those uh, that are sometimes barriers to us embracing our own worthiness for Mm self-care. Yes. You know, you really tapped into the essence of the book and the acknowledgement of uniqueness and individuality in the healing journey. Yeah. And and the trauma informed care piece, which really acknowledges and celebrates that our journeys are not linear and that context also matters. And so in some of those those roots that you named in terms of where we learn, where we tend to learn about self-care first. Um, I I know for me in the Black community, I didn't really see many models of self-care. There was the strong Black woman. In the book, I use that as one word. Um, Mm -hmm. I didn't really see models, strong models of what it meant to take care of yourself. In Mm -hmm. fact, one of the values that I heard being celebrated in in my community was to be selfless. And so many of us have been conditioned to put the the needs of other folks, people, places, and things in front of ourselves. And I draw the connection to the nervous system, the tendon befriend um, trauma reaction, which is about attending to the people, places, and things that are causing harm as a means of survival to de-escalate, to protect, to keep ourselves safe. And and I believe that some of the roots of tendon befriend mode becoming a way of being is in enslavement. And so, you know, enslaved ancestors literally had to take care of others in order to retain breath in, in their bodies. And so this is something that is directly connected to the decolonizing healing that we we were speaking of earlier. It is to, um, as much as we can, undo and unlearn in our bodies and our ways of being and in the ways that we care for ourselves, um, different from what we've been conditioned to do. Mm-hmm. And it can be really, really hard and counterintuitive um, because that's not the story that lives in our in our bodies, but we are all so worthy of our own care and love. Mm. So beautiful. And as we take in that we are worthy of that care and love, uh, as a survivor who works with survivors, one of your phrases that really stood out to me was reclaiming our body sovereignty. And then Mm -hmm. you go on to say, knowing that your body is yours. Mm -hmm. So can you talk some about body sovereignty and Mm -hmm. knowing our body belongs to us? Yeah. So if you could see me, you would see that I have tears in my eyes. You can probably hear in my voice that, you know, hearing that said back to me, even though I wrote it, it still (laughs) touches me. This is why I wrote this book. I believe that Black beings at home and survivors at home in their bodies are forces of nature. And, um, you know, I, I look forward to hearing stories of folks moving back home in their bodies, making choices for their bodies and feeling unapologetic about that embodying their freedom and choice and power and living out this beautiful relationship where they have dominion over their body. They remember the sacredness of their body and protect it fiercely, that they trust the body's medicine, the body remembers, and the body has infinite wisdom. 
Mm. And I'm reminded of a poem that I have in the book. Would it be okay? Yes, please. I would love that. Okay. All right. So this book is in the first journey, I believe. It says, someone stole your choice when they decided for you. Mm. They took your body into their own hands and out of yours. And with it, you may have watched your voice trail behind or felt it become lodged in your throat, skewered by your breath. You may have seen the sense of where your body begins and ends dissolve. The choices are medicinal, beloved. May you choose healing in every moment. May you choose to snatch yourself back. Hold it like it belongs to you. Hold on to you and your body. Hear your voice return, singing musical yeses and noes. Feel your breath be free and wild in your body where you belong. Mm, So powerful. So powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I know people will replay the whole uh, conversation, but especially to let the poem wash Mm -hmm. over us. And the book is so affirming and informative. As I was saying before we started recording, you have the science and the poetry there, which uh, I just love. And one of the affirmations that you talk about is us repairing our intuition, Mm -hmm. which I think about is repairing our trust of ourselves, of our inner knowing. And you say, you know what's best for you, beloved. Mm-hmm. All day, every day. You yes. know what's best for you. This is one of my favorite things to talk about, Dr. Taman. I feel yes. like it's often left out of healing space and, and traditional therapy spaces in particular. This is the spirit part of that mind, body, heart, spirit care. Spirit is about our relationship to God or God's creator, source, higher self, our intuition, our ancestors and spirit. And I believe that one of the most damaging ruptures of experiencing sexual trauma is to intuition. You know, this can go way back to a young person who is who felt like what was happening was wrong, felt in their bodies because the body be knowing, right? <laughs> felt yes. in their bodies that mm-hmm. this was wrong, but they were they were groomed to think otherwise and maybe made to feel special. Or as an adult being coerced into saying yes with your mouth, but your body is screaming no. It really creates a a wide gap and rupture to those sensations of intuition that tell us that something isn't right. And so finding our way back to a strong, intimate relationship with our intuition, which will never, will never lead us astray, Mm -hmm. is one of the most important choices, I think, on the healing journey. And so I often tell people, repair your relationship with your intuition, like your life depends on it. And know the difference in your body and in your spirit, the difference between your intuition guiding you and your trauma misleading you. Because they can feel the same in the body, but they're very different. They're very, Mm. very different. Yes, yes. Well, you all, we have only scratched the surface. I really (laughs) encourage you to uh, follow Dr. Sheena. Uh, Tell them your website and social media. And again, the book is Body Rights, a Holistic Healing and Embodiment Workbook for Black Survivors of Sexual Trauma. Yes, thank you, Dr. Tama. My website is www.embodiedtruthhealing.com. And the website's so beautiful. Um, I really invite you to come and get to know me through the website and my work. And you can follow me on Instagram at Embodied Truth Healing as well. And um, I look forward to connecting and hearing how our time together landed with you. 
Mm, and I will just read this one final line and you can briefly say what it means to you and why you said it to us. Okay. You are already whole. You've mm. just forgotten. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You know, we live in a world that insists on investing in our brokenness. Mm. And so I like to remind us of our wholeness, that we are already whole. We are already whole. We're just finding our way back and remembering, remembering the wholeness. Yes. Yes. I appreciate you so much. And uh, this book has been so nourishing. So for all of you who are listening, I invite your soul to tell your heart, mind, body, and spirit welcome home. Mm-hmm.